everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Meg. I'm one of the co-coordinators of Theories in Action this year, along with Yuna Her and Dean Peggy Chang at the Explorer Resource Center. So we're really excited to have over 60 seniors participating in the conference uh, this year, and we're so excited to have some of them here to speak with you today. They've titled their presentation, Lessons from Our Community, and they're facilitated by Christina Phillips. Please join me in welcoming them. Welcome to the 2018 Theories in Action TIA Roundtable discussion around the lessons from our community. Um, this is a time for seniors to reflect upon, share with, and connect with other members of the senior class, members of the Brown community, um, the greater Providence community, families, and friends. This year's theme is, for 2018 TIA is how has your time at Brown helped you to connect the dots? Um, so we have six lovely seniors here to talk about that and also around um, lessons around their, their communities. Um, the first presenter is Trang Duong. Um, she is a senior at Brown University majoring in Applied Mathematics and Development Studies. She is a CEO of Penta Prosthetics Group, a social venture that has repurposed um, three million dollars worth of used prosthetic limbs for amputees in developing countries. Trying is used is currently a social innovation fellow at Brown Square Center and a Yale Entrepreneurship Institute fellow. Trying has been awarded the Clinton Global Foundation One Year Gr McKinsey Grant, wait, One Year Grant McKinsey 2017 Women's Impact Award, Yale's Rothberg Four Catalyzer Award, and Brown Venture Prize. So let's give a big round of applause to her. Hi guys, so the topic today is our communities. And so my overarching theme for what I'm gonna talk about today is how my community at Brown links with my community back home and my journey at Brown and how it has led me to uh, found Penta and what I'm doing after college. So I'm actually uh, in a month, I'm moving back to Vietnam and working full time on the company. Um, so. Yeah, I came here at Brown and I was unsure what I was majoring in and I actually started as a biology major. And I was conflicted because I wanted to do something that linked back to Vietnam, um, but I wasn't sure how to do that. And so through development studies, um, I was able to get a fellowship where I researched the healthcare system in Vietnam and this is where I started my company. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the company, and then you guys can ask me questions after that. But um, Penta is a nonprofit organization that repurposes used medical devices for amputees in developing countries. The main barrier for people in developing countries is cost. So prosthetic limbs are super expensive. They range from $2,000 to $10,000. And this is way beyond the price range that anyone can afford. So 95% of amputees in the developing world don't have any access to prosthetic devices. And at the same time, in the US, we have 400,000 prosthetic limbs that are replaced annually. However, there's no system to recycle this, these devices and their liability and regulation issues that forbid them to be used again in the US. However, these are highly reusable parts. They're really high quality. As you can see, they're really expensive. And with the right quality control management, they can be reused again. So what we've done so far is we've repurposed over $3 million worth of prosthetic limbs, and we've helped more than 200 amputees walk again. And so this year, we've partnered with the Vietnam Ministry of Health um, to provide 1,000 limbs for amputees in rural areas of Vietnam. So before we couldn't reach these people in the rural areas because there was no infrastructure, but through this, this partnership, we were able to reach a lot of these amputees. So I want to tell you a little bit more about how our U.S. partnerships work. Uh, in the U.S., we partner with different prosthetic clinic chains. We place a box inside each clinic, and so whenever a patient comes in or they have spare parts, they place the components into these collection boxes, um, and then 
each month we come and we collect them. And we consolidated this into a warehouse. So a third party logistics company actually does this for us and then it's shipped to our quality control facility in Vietnam Ho Chi Minh City. And it goes through a rigorous process of quality management before it's sent off to our local partners, which are public hospitals, private clinics, foundations, the Ministry of Health, and they handle all of the fittings. Um, and the fittings are done by trained prosthesis and physicians. Um, a little bit about how recustomization works. So actually all the parts, if you look at this, below the knee is all reusable because they're standardized components. And the only part that needs to be remade are the socket, which is actually the cheapest part of the whole prosthetic, usually costs in the developing world around $60 to remake it. And the most expensive parts are all the parts below. Yeah, so that's, we have a non-profit branch. And so now I'm gonna move on to our technology branch. We've also been developing technology um, in, and I've partnered with one of my high school friends who's an engineer at the MIT Media Lab. And we got together and he happened to be working on prosthetic devices for his senior thesis. So I was like, what a great collaboration, what a great idea to get together. So what we've done is a little bit, wait, let me frame the problem a little bit. So prosthetics now in the developing world, any like the 5% that do have it have really low quality prosthetics. So they're either made of like thermal plastics or wood. So they look something like this. And the foot is essentially static. Current really high quality prosthetics here in the developing world, the developed world uh, uses these motors and electronics to basically create this movement and power. And so that power is not available in the low cost devices. So what the foot innovation has done and what my friend at MIT Media Lab is, is essentially use his background designing high tech devices and, de and design a really simple and low cost solution without compromising the quality of it. So what he has done is put a spring inside. And so this spring helps lift off and create that power that the electronics would create. So when an amputee walks, this metal spring literally stores and then releases this energy to help the amputee walk and regain their normal walking patterns. And what is interesting is you can actually switch out the spring as well according to the person's weight, so it's customizable. Yeah, and I think the main, the biggest differentiation is that the cost of producing it is only $10, which is significantly below any of the solutions um, available right now. So we've just finished our trial and regulations um, with the with a, a partnership with the largest orthopedic hospital in Vietnam. And so now we're waiting for the approval of the Ministry of Health. And I will be working full time on the company after college, working on this with two of my good friends. So that's how my journey here as, at Brown has brought me to create this social venture. And I'm really excited to work on it after college. Any questions? What's the biggest challenge in working with these um, sort of, you know, marginalized and often underserved populations in your experience? Yeah, I think it's really difficult because we're unable to work directly with them in many of the cases when we want to achieve scale. So when we're working directly with a lot of these groups, in the public hospitals, we were able to do maybe a few hundred because we're limited by the capacity of our staff. Now that we partner with larger organizations, I would say my biggest challenge is to find really reputable um, foundations and partners to partners with so we can accurately measure the outcomes of um, what we've done. 
So, um, it, I mean, it's a very interesting loophole you found that you can bring American prosthetics, which are of relatively high quality, and, and reuse them in, in a country that's developing. So, what's um, where did that idea come from? How did you? What was what was your epiphany that led to to this realization that you could actually achieve this? Yeah. So a lot of so when I started my research, I was just being doing like. An app, being like an anthropologist and just observing. So I just sat in a lot of um, prosthesis clinics here and observed their work. And basically, I was doing research. I didn't think about starting a company. Um, and so through that, I saw that a lot of these components were just being thrown out. So they would have like a spring cleaning every two, three weeks. And I was like, well, wait a minute, these can be reused. And another thing was, when I was at hospitals in Vietnam, I saw that a lot of amputees were making their own prosthetics out of metal scraps. And so I was, like, I was amazed by that. So that combination made me to think that, oh, there's a demand and supply imbalance here, and it could be solved with something. All right. You can learn more if you just go on www.pentaprosthetics.com. Thank you, and we will um, do questions at the end for the, um, the remainder of the presenters. Um, Trang has to leave a little bit early. Um, but the next presentation that we have is from Leanne Cho and Beatrice Bougane. Um, Leanne was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Her concentration at Brown is neuroscience and she plans to pursue a career as a physician scientist. Um, she is passionate about mental health and in addition to exploring the unknown in brain science, she is also interested in the ways that institutions play a role in promoting well-being on a structural level. Bia it is an in international student from Brazil and Italy, where she studies, and she studies English literature. Much of her international identity has been shaped by the international mentoring program and the work that it does. IMP has helped her made a home at Brown, and this has in turn propelled her into becoming active in student groups on campus. At Brown, Bia has spent her time rehearsing in Brown's oldest all-female a cappella group, The Chatter Talks, and engaging in mental health advocacy through Project Let's. This summer, she'll be working at W.W. Norton & Company in New York City in a publishing internship, and in the fall, she'll pr pursue an MFA in fiction at the University of Oregon. Let's give a round of applause to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, international student support at Brown and how that's changed over the course of four years, um, especially in the time that we've been here. Um, so currently, B and I are the outgoing senior coordinators of the International Mentoring Program, which we'll talk about. Um, but we started out as mentees, and then we were mentors, and then we were juniors, and then seniors. So there's kind of been an evolution in the amount of support that's been available, and we'll be talking about what that is and a little bit our role and experiences with that. Um, an important component of our journey has also been um, advocating for more change and more change that is rooted in the administration as well at Brown, um, and starting you know new projects and new um, sections of campus life, um, like the international student experience. So imagine that you are an incoming international student about to begin your first year at Brown. What are some of your concerns or fears in the weeks leading up to Brown that are specific to your international identity? Any of you could contribute? Will I fit in here? <laughs> Will I fit in here? Absolutely. How well, many international students from the same region of the world as I am are going to be at Brown? Mm -hmm. 
And what do you imagine might be some concerns that would arise uh, later on throughout your time at Brown as an international student? How do I build credit in the US? <laughs> So there are a lot of things that international students need to think about that maybe aren't easy to imagine if you aren't in that exact position. And those issues range from very simple things like where do I get a cell phone, uh, I have to open up a bank account, to you know wider and more um, troubling matters such as what is my visa status, uh, how do I work in the United States, how do I stay here if I want to continue to live in the United States after my time at college. And then there's also um, more emotional struggles such as homesickness, not being able to go home over the holidays, either due to timing where there's not a holiday in your home country, financial reasons, or um, recently in the political climate, um, there's you know travel bans and the like. Um, there's also stereotypes about international students that might provide a barrier um, to feeling at home in this community. Um, and also, uh, cultural differences take time to adjust to. So all of these things um, uh, we think about when we think about how to support international students. So these images are just a few of the ones that we were able to find on clip art. <laughs> So there are a few uh, things that international students need to think about that are even more hidden beneath the surface and that as an international student yourself, you would have to go digging around for. Um, for instance, admission for incoming international students is not need blind, so this means that prospective students do not apply for financial aid oftentimes because they fear that it will diminish their chances of being accepted. Uh, the problem is that if they are accepted without financial aid and then they need it, they aren't allowed to apply for that aid once they are already accepted at Brown, and so that puts students in a very difficult position. Um, and that also means that if a student comes into Brown with their aid or with their tuition taken care of, say, by family members, uh, if that changes throughout their time at Brown, and they suddenly need to apply for aid, they do not have that option. Um, also, international students aren't allowed to work off campus. Um, uh, so in terms of summer internships, this gets a little tricky. Um, what we have to do is the internship has to be directly related to your major or your concentration. And so you need to have that integral to the curriculum, meaning that you need to do an independent study out of this internship that you take that takes place the following semester. And so not only does that take the spot of a course that you might otherwise take, that really um, puts limitations on what types of internships you're allowed to get. Um, you need to get those internships earlier in the spring semester so that you can have time to develop this independent study and connect with an, a faculty advisor who can sponsor you for this. Um, yeah. and. Furthermore, you can't work in the U.S. until you've declared a concentration, and so that leaves with you with even fewer options for your first summer after freshman year. In terms of finding work after Brown, international students have the opportunity to take on a year-long work experience after graduation, so that would be the OPT. Um, your work experience does have to have something to do with your major at Brown. There has to be a connection there. Uh, and you can extend this period if you work, um, if your major is within any of the STEM majors. And so oftentimes some international students will consider changing their major, um, working in something within STEM in order to be able to have that option to extend their work experience after graduation. And in order to work in the U.S. long term, a student must be sponsored by a company or obtain a visa with specific requirements and expectations. And so that also adds um, to this idea of maybe working in a field that has better financial uh, support, that has more money, because that company is more likely to uh, sponsor you. All right, so, giving all, so given all these challenges and things that international students face, 
um, uniquely. We're going to launch into another interactive activity, and we want to hear from you. Uh, okay, um, so that's our second question. Okay, so given these challenges, how might an international student feel upon first arriving in the United States? Um, and if you take out your phones and go to this website and put in that code, we will create a word cloud based on what you say. Could you repeat the question again? Yes. Uh, given these challenges that we just discussed, how might an international student feel upon first arriving in the United States? Interesting. All right. Is this, these are all your answers? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> what is boxing? <laughs> well, it was supposed to be the other question, um, but these are the answers also. Yeah, so sorry about that. So we will address some of these uh, feelings, hopefully with our description of what the International Mentoring Program aims to do. Um, what is Buxton is a real question, um, because that is one big international organization that is big on campus, uh, the International House. However, it is not fully representative of the international student body, um, and so I think with organizations like IMP, we try to provide another group um, that international students can um, sort of gravitate towards and try to make their own experience of that group whatever they want it to be. So what is, what was, and what will be international student support? So the International Mentoring Program aims to provide institutional, social, and academic support to all incoming first years, helping students to transition not only from high school into college, but also into the experience of attending college specifically in the United States. So what IMP does during international orientation is it pairs uh, mentors, a class of mentors that we select with the incoming international students who have registered for international orientation and each mentor takes care of 12 to 15 uh, freshman students and so the program is a year-long program and so it continues beyond orientation. Um, it starts off with summer contacts that each incoming student um, obtains from their region, and then um, after international orientation, the students stay with their mentors, um, stay in touch throughout the year, and continue to meet. And um, in general, inter 
the international mentoring program seeks to create a sense of community for its students and um, a welcoming environment into which they can enter. Um, so one thing to note about the International Mentoring Program is that prior to uh, 2016, it was nearly entirely student-run. Um, and so the coordinators of the International Mentoring Program is a team of four. And it used to be such that the team of four students basically did everything um, from catering to space bookings to printing and editing all the documents for orientation, which includes programs and invitations, sending emails, inviting Christina Paxson, all of that, um, which was a lot of work. There was very limited um, administrative support. Um, uh, VP Delalu was our advisor in 2016, but she was transitioning into the provost office and now she's a VP, so it was a time of transition and we had um, Susan Vieira from Global Brown who also helped us, but she was also helping with transfer orientation at the time, and so it just became a lot for, for students to handle. Um, and so with conversations with some higher level administrators such as um, now VP Delalu and VP Eric Estes and Mary Grace Amandres, we now have um, a larger organization that IMP is now embedded in, um, ISE. So ISE, um, for those of you who don't know, it stands for International Student Experience, and it is a new identity center, um, as we say, that's analogous to the BCSC or the Fly Center or the uh, Cerrado Women's Center. And it is a resource for both undergraduate and graduate students. So prior to this, there wasn't even really a student-run initiative um, about uh, for graduate international students. And there's programming for a variety of causes. So um, everything from community building, like hosting a social, all the way to um, providing support on what to do for life after Brown. We had a career conference. This is what International Student Experience aims to do. Um, International Student Experience also supports student organizations, so such as IMP, but also heritage groups and other advocacy groups. Anybody who really wants to do anything related to international students or international life, um, come to ISE. And we have two locations. The first is in New Dorm. Um, and the second is in JWW on the third floor. There's a new Global Brown Lounge that was also launched within this past year. Yeah. And so these are just some pictures from the events that we've had even just this year. So at the bottom there, um, ISE took everyone snow tubing and um, those are some of the new student staff. So not only do we have a new space, but a new program director, which is Christina, but there's also um, more student staff working to improve the programming for international students, which is, has really made a difference. Yeah, so these are some of the graphics that we have, which was, were created by um, a student staff member. Um, of some of the events that ISE has hosted. And there have been many um, very helpful and innovative initiatives that have contributed to IMP um, as well because the sense of support has trickled down um, and it has reached um, to also sort of embrace the first years coming in. Um, and so there has been increased compensation for student work um, off-campus trips for international students, cultural cafes, uh, collaboration with various different centers on campus, um, and a more effective international student advisory board. Um, yes, I feel like you covered it. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, there's still changes to be made, um, but we're optimistic that there is a plan to work towards these. So international student financial aid, moving from need aware to need blind, um, because of the support that ISE has given to the International Student Advisory Board, there has been more movement with that, which would be uh, fantastic. Um, there's, we still want to educate domestic students about international life, um, so hopefully this presentation kind of helped to do that, but 
um, the stereotypes are still existing, and so that's something that we want to um, move away from eventually. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with creating and maintaining a comfortable and, spa and safe environment. Um, especially in this political environment, um, we found that there was a really significant drop in international students who are going to be coming to Brown next year because of everything happening with the government. So um, kind of we want to really make sure that students know that they are welcome here and when they are here, really do support them. Um, and then finally, hopefully re reforming the CPT process, which is internal to Brown. So um, if Brown didn't, was okay with not having us do an independent study, that would be fantastic. <laughs> and finally, some of the lessons from our communities, um, our community at IMP and, um, you know, at the, on the level of international students in general at Brown um, has taught us to think about how supporting um, identity groups is important and uh, the different avenues of support. And so um, as a coordinator myself, I've drawn from um, a lot from my peers and the other coordinators who work with me on this project, um, as well as the mentor class that we select every year. And with without those individuals um, working with me on this project and supporting me along the way, um, I think I think the um, that IMP would not be as strong as it is because it is such a demanding um, organization to be a part of. Um, and more recently, we've also received a lot of support from institutions, and so how institutions work, how the administration at Brown works and how we are able to leverage change um, by speaking up, by standing up for ourselves, by holding others accountable, and um, by advocating for international students. All right, and that's it. So we're going to do questions at the end. Thank you, Leanne and Bia. The next speaker is Andrew Stambulidis. Um, he is presenting on Rhode Island Adult Drug Court, his uh, Rhode Island Adult Drug Court Internship. Um, Andrew is a senior at Brown University, majoring in an independent concentration in politics, philosophy, and economics. He is from the Rhode Long Island, New York and enjoys fishing, traveling, and playing basketball. Having spent a semester abroad in Greece, Andrew enjoys meeting new people and exploring the culture of his ancestry. After graduation, Andrew plans to attend law school and work on criminal justice reform in the United States. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the first two presenters as well. That was very interesting, eye-opening. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit today about my internship with the Rhode Island Adult Drug Court. And before I get into what drug courts are and what this specific drug court does, I want to talk a little bit about the context in which drug courts were created and the problems that they're aiming to solve. So as we all know, the criminal justice system in the United States has its flaws and we see statistics on an everyday basis about problems that are ongoing. Um, I want to talk specifically about drug laws for a little bit and how they operate in various communities in keeping with the theme of lessons in our community. Uh, we all know that addiction and criminal justice affect many in very real human and moral ways in our communities and that's why I feel it's appropriate to mention that. So uh, the ways that various drug laws operate in Rhode Island and throughout the country uh, as many of us know, uh, we know that there's uh, charges that are called possession of a controlled substance, for example, schedules one through five drugs. This includes heroin, marijuana, cocaine, fentanyl, and possession of any of them, if caught by police, will lead to an individual being arrested and starting the process in which he's booked, charged, brought in front of a judge and arraigned on those charge, and subsequently he'll most likely plead guilty in 99% of cases and at that point, you are branded and labeled as a felon, in which case you'll either be incarcerated for several months or put on probation for several years. 
Either way, the consequence of that situation is that you'll be labeled a felon, and when you move into education, employment, and housing endeavors in the future, you're going to have severe problems with that as a result of that labeling and that felony conviction. Now, this occurs to millions of citizens throughout the United States, regardless of whether or not they spend time in jail, and it occurs to hundreds of thousands of citizens in the history of Rhode Island, specifically in Providence and many of the major cities. Now, two important examples of this felony conviction process uh, show how when this system becomes embedded and ingrained in our conception of criminal justice, it's hard for us to question it, and even in the face of these statistics and problems, which I'll get to later, we become so normalized to the system that no one questions it or uh, takes a stance against it. And so we see concepts of prison and criminal justice on TV, in movies, shows like Cops. Some of us experience it more directly through friends, family members, or ourselves. Either way, we all come to know and understand the prison as, an, as a semblance of society in the same way that, that schools, hospitals, and other institutions are. So we hesitate to question something that's so normalized. Now one example of how the system starts to operate in a way where the goals become uh, you know, diverted from the original intentions is that <clears throat> police officials, and this is common knowledge for law enforcement in Rhode Island, police and other law enforcement agents can target specific street corners in neighborhoods in Providence and other areas of Rhode Island where they know they can make drug arrests on a, cons on a consistent basis and arrest large numbers of individuals because of um, they know what, what houses are buy spots, where people are selling, what types of groups of people are hanging around in specific areas at what times of day. And they can make continuous arrests at those spots, leading to a continuous flow of drug arrests and adding to those felony convictions. Uh, another important example, which I find, uh, when I first found, was even more striking. This is at the federal level. Um, I found this out during an internship in federal district court in New York about two years ago, um, just by walking into any courtroom on any given day. It's common knowledge for federal law enforcement that on any given day at JFK, if you stop specific flight numbers from specific cities and countries, two being Lagos, Nigeria, another being Colombia, you can take as many people off those planes as there are agents to book them and arrest them for drug trafficking. Now most often these people are extremely poverty stricken, desperate individuals who are not criminals but they accept a small sum of money in exchange for trafficking drugs, usually in their stomachs, Across the, across the world into the United States. Now, these people get added to the statistics of drug crime arrests and felony convictions in our country. And so the system, which you know, we originally conceive of as trying to help people, rehabilitate people, get them on the right track, now it becomes this you know, overarching, um, you know, non-stopping progression in which people get felony convictions and added to the millions of uh, incarcerated people in the country. Now we know that the United States uh, incarcerates over 2 million people. We are the biggest incarceration state in the country. 80% um, of offenders are known to abuse drugs or alcohol, which they're not being treated for in prison. And one in three black men in our country are at a lifetime risk of being arrested and incarcerated in their lifetime. Now these statistics are obviously absurd and strike out when we see them on paper, but when they're associated with a system such as prison and incarceration that we've all become so uh, normalized to and ingrained in our conception of criminal justice, we hesitate to question it. And so a couple decades ago, 1989, a couple of individuals led by Janet Reno, the former attorney, former attorney general, started the first drug court in Miami. Now, before I get into drug courts, I want to tell a little bit about my first experience with the drug court, which again was in that uh, federal courthouse in the Eastern District of New York. I was interning for a judge. Uh, I had no idea what a drug court was, nor was I intending to get involved with it, but on the first Wednesday of my internship, it was drug court day. So I walked into a courtroom. Uh, I sat down with the law clerks. Uh, there was a, about 15 people sitting in a circle who I came to know were the drug court participants, and they were talking, so I sat down next to them. At the front of the room was the judge's bench, um, where the judge usually stands. So I was waiting to hear, you know, all rise, Honorable Judge John Gleason, Everyone please stand and take your seat. Um, that didn't happen. The judge came in through a side door. He sat down at an open seat in that circle of people and he began speaking with the drug court participants for two hours, one by one, everyone telling the story of how they have engaged in a process of rehabilitation and treatment after facing felony drug convictions, serious felony drug convictions, uh, I might add. I was sitting next to people who had been found at JFK with pounds of marijuana, pounds of cocaine on them 
And instead of going to jail and, and, to, and going through that incarceration process I spoke about, they were given the chance to engage in treatment in a drug court under the supervision of a judge who monitored their progress for 12 months. And if they were able to maintain sobriety, they would have their felonies dismissed, reintegrate into society, and get employment and housing opportunities that they never would have had. So this is a whole new conception of criminal justice that I walk into uh, unknowingly. And now, you know, uh, here I am two years later uh, pursuing an internship in the Rhode Island Adult Drug Court and, and really getting a sense of how people are actually out there trying to change the system uh, that, that is, you know, hurting so many people in such detrimental ways. Now, what is a drug court? Uh, the official definition of a drug court is a judicially supervised treatment proceeding in which a judge oversees convicted, uh, convicted drug offenders who are drug addicts and if they can maintain sobriety for 12 months while being monitored through drug tests, uh, counseling services, and meetings with the judge, their felonies are dismissed, their court costs are waived, their records are sealed, and they're able to maintain uh, you know, a healthy and sober life while reintegrating into society and not being branded as that you know, second class citizen, a felon who can't really succeed in employment and, and housing and education outcomes. So that was my first drug court experience in the federal court in New York. About two years later, I pursued an internship with Magistrate Judge Flynn, who started a program in Rhode Island. It's called the Rhode Island Adult Drug Court. It began in 2002 as a pilot program with 30 to 50 individuals. Um, and now in 2018, it has 171 participants. And it has an exceedingly, uh, you know, exceedingly uh, well success rate compared to other drug courts in the country. 70% of people in the past six years have graduated. Uh, on the first Wednesday of my drug court internship, I witnessed a young man who was graduating from the program. He had maintained sobriety for 12 months. He was employed. He had reconnected with his family and friends who had been cut off when he was uh, on drugs. And it, it's interesting to see where he was on that day and to look at his report and his progress and where he had been in the past. Um, I, I looked at his report and I learned that this young man who was standing in front of me, very well put together, he looked amazing, he was smiling, happy, talking to the judge. Uh, about two years ago, and for the past five years before that, he was addicted to opiates and fentanyl on and off for a long period of time. Uh, during that time period, he had overdosed six times, he had been hospitalized, on the verge of death. He had appeared before the judge in early 2016, homeless disconnected from his family and friends, literally strung out on drugs, he was doing heroin and fentanyl, and had no hope for you know, a future employment, housing, or any type of life at all. And through the use of the adult drug court and through constant communication with the judge, who had to be harsh at some times, the judge locked him up one weekend in order to get a residential bed so that he could be treated and, and actually get sober. And after that weekend, 12 straight months of sobriety had led this man to a point in his life that was inconceivable before, and inconceivable in any criminal justice system that doesn't involve this new type of restorative justice. So thanks to the help of Magistrate Judge Flynn, the Rhode Island State Prosecutor, the Rhode Island Probation Officer, all these people who took the initiative, who looked at this system that's so normalized and said, wait, this isn't adding up, this is not the purpose of what we're trying to do, they came together and gave this man an opportunity. That man's mother stood up at that meeting and she said, thank you, Judge Flynn, I cannot, you know, I, she hadn't even been speaking to her son, she didn't know where he was a year ago. Now he was back, on, he was employed, sober, and continuing with his life. She said, thank you, Judge Flynn, for not making, letting my son become another statistic. And it's true, he didn't become another statistic. He didn't become one of the 343 overdoses in Rhode Island in 2017. He didn't become one of the 46% of offenders who become rearrested after their first drug offense and continue on the cycle of recidivism throughout their lives. But he did become one of the 602 graduates of the Rhode Island Adult Drug Court in the past six years. He did become part of that 70%. And so he is a statistic in a new criminal justice system, one that actually looks at the real human and moral dimensions of these crimes. And instead of labeling these people as defendants with case numbers, they treat them as real individuals with human problems and take personal circumstances into account. So as I said, in 2011, there was 94 fatal overdoses in Rhode Island. In 2017, there was 323. That represents a 343% increase, and a major cause of that, as I mentioned before briefly, is fentanyl. 
a lot of these people come in and sometimes they're honest with us. They'll say, you know, I, th I think I used cocaine, I used heroin, I used cocaine. But when we drug screen them, it comes up as fentanyl, which is a highly addictive and high risk overdose drug that is being mixed with these other substances and it's causing a lot of overdose, de overdose deaths in our state. Um, the number of fentanyl overdoses was 15 times higher in 2017 than it was in 2009. And these users are completely unaware that, that it's being used and it's being put in the substances they're using. So that's some of the reasons that the drug court came about, specifically in Rhode Island, additionally on the national scale. Um, some of the, as I mentioned, the incentives for these people in drug court are twofold. One is the legal benefit, which often is very important. As I said, if you can maintain sobriety for 12 months during these drug screens and meetings with the judge, you'll have your felony dismissed. Sometimes it's multiple felonies. Uh, so for example, possession of controlled substance, if you have a baggie of heroin in a certain amount, uh, you'll get charged with possession of co controlled substance. You might also get charged with present possession with intent to uh, deliver. And so each of those counts would face up to three years in prison and or a maximum, if you take a plea deal, probably uh, four years probation, both of which end up labeling you as a felon and putting you down that process we described earlier. So the legal benefit is huge. You have the felony dismissed, court costs waves, records sealed, you reintegrate into society without being labeled as a felon. Oftentimes though, and you know, this was surprising to me, it's something you have to experience, but the legal benefit is not the most important benefit. The most important benefit for these people is literally getting the chance to get their lives on track, maintain sobriety, and live. I mean, people come into the courtrooms at certain times, and, and I see it on the reports, I see it in person, um, they're like on the verge of death. And, and it's hard to see, it's hard to talk about, and it's hard to experience, but it's a reality. And addiction is a serious disease affecting a lot of people. So without a program that is trying to help these people instead of putting them in a cell and saying, you know, go learn how to become a, a more serious criminal, come back to jail, uh, the judge, judge Flynn and the rest of the drug court program are really taking those considerations into account and trying to help these people. Um, in addition to those incentives, there's punishment mechanisms included, uh, which involve increased counseling in terms of, in times of relapse or, or lying to the judge, uh, community service, and as I said, brief sense of incarceration in order to wait for a residential treatment bed to become available. Now all those I've seen used successfully, and, and it's difficult because when you're taking personal circumstances into account and you're recognizing you know, that these people are going through serious problems, uh, it, it's hard to just punish them in a way that really uh, understands that. But, you know, and something, that's something that I was confused about when I got into the program. But witnessing Judge Flynn uh, and the way he deals with people, every, I've seen several people who have been incarcerated, who have been kicked out of the program. Everyone says to Judge Flynn, like, you are, I've seen them say, stand up, you are a fair man. Uh, what you have done to me has, has been an attempt to help me, and I respect you for respecting me. And it's really interesting to see that um, when people see that, that these actors in the criminal justice system are respecting them and trying to help them, they're incentivized to help themselves in a new way. And instead of being thrown in prison and, and kind of told by society that you're, you know, you're an evildoer, you're forgotten, they're told, hey, you know, we care about you, we want to get you on the right track. And so it helps both sides uh, in terms of getting a solution. So as I said, since 2006, 858 participants were admitted into the Rhode Island Adult Drug Court program. 604 of them successfully graduated. This represents a 70% success rate, with only 232 being discharged from the program. And that involves uh, you know, people who, who lied continuously to the judge, weren't serious uh, about getting sober, or weren't even serious drug uh, addicts. Sometimes people slip into the program uh, who attempt to use it without just to get felonies dismissed without really being uh, addicted to drugs. So some other statistics that talk about the success of the Rhode Island Adult Drug Court involve recidivism rates and, um, and cost savings. So the average one year recidivism rate of a Rhode Island Adult Drug Court participant after graduation is only 12%, compared to 46% of Rhode Island offenders who reoffend within the first six months in regular criminal court. Additionally, cost savings produced involve $4,000 to $12,000 per participant. So just by putting them in this program for 12 months and helping them get sobriety, you're avoiding incarcerating them and putting them on probation and putting them through the whole process of the criminal justice system that would have cost an extreme amount of money 
And that is something that has allowed uh, bipartisan support to become accumulated on this issue. So even conservatives recognize the cost savings involved and recognize the real human and moral dimensions to this uh, that have allowed this to occur. So looking into the future, just this past year, the Presidential Commission on Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis in America, headed by Governor Chris Christie, set out a list of recommendations to deal with drug addiction and the opioid, opioid crisis in America. The first recommendation on that list was to institute federal drug courts in every judicial district in the country. And they said, quote, drug courts are known to be significantly more effective than incarceration, but 44% of US counties do not have an adult drug court. The DOJ should urge states to establish state drug courts in every county. So as you can see, Rhode Island has developed a solution to this pro problem by recognizing that the system of criminal justice is not serving the purpose it was set out to accomplish. Uh, by, literally, you know, by literally targeting specific street corners and neighborhoods and arresting as many people as we can, that's not accomplishing anything other than branding people as felons and causing communities to be destroyed. Um, no one set out to have a criminal justice system aimed at doing this, and as I said, when it becomes ingrained in the way we think of society, it's hard to question that. But it's really inspiring to sit down and, and hear stories and see stories of people who have gone through this process, which could be the future of criminal justice, and I hope it is. Uh, additionally, this doesn't really refer to violent crimes and other uh, robberies and home invasions and other types of criminal activity, which should be uh, reformed as well. But I think the best way and the most practical way to approach solving this is to take a stepping stone and use this common ground that we can, that everyone has agreed upon. The statistics show it, the stories show it, the failures show it, uh, that drug courts can be a stepping stone to change the way we look at criminal justice in our country and in Rhode Island. And so in terms of connecting the dots and, and looking at the bigger picture, I think that Brown has helped me to pursue experiences where I would even be involved in a situation uh, like a drug court. So to pursue that first internship and to end up sitting with people uh, who had gotten their lives back on track, uh, Brown pushed me and helped me to come here. And I think it's really inspiring to see uh, the progress that can be made. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Our next nice. speaker is Alina Joharjian. Um, she will be t t speaking on understanding undergraduate attitudes toward public service to create a more diverse workforce. Alina is a senior at Brown University studying public policy. She leads Brown Public Policy Undergraduate Group from, or she led Brown Public Policy Undergraduate Group from 2016 to 2018, where she organized inclusivity initiatives for first generation and low income college students in the department. During a time, her time at Brown, she has also worked with Design for America and a student run social venture, Tink Knit. Alina interned at Governor Gina M. Raimondo's office and at an education technology startup involved, which aims to create, to solve chronic absenteeism. These experiences has shaped Alina's interest in data-driven, innovative gover government that is representative of its citizens. Please welcome Alina. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. So, um, as Christina said, I'm a senior concentrating in public policy, and this semester I have been working on an independent research project with my capstone advisor, Tony Levitas, who is the public policy department head. So my project has been about understanding attitudes towards public service. So, there are a few challenges that exist within public service. The first is that there is an aging workforce. So particularly within local government, city and state government, um, a lot of the people who work there are approaching retiring age. This kind of feeds into the next issue, which is that there is a struggle to find talent in these local governments. So um, I think a lot of us are familiar with companies like Google and Microsoft that actively come to campus and will try to recruit students. This type of recruitment does not exist for governments. They don't have the time or money um, to try to hire people at, like a year in advance in order for them to like solidify their position um, at their office. So that along with um, like 
the aging workforce um, is an issue, those kind of feedback into each other. Another thing is that there's low levels of trust in government. So a lot of students don't look towards government as a career where they can make an impact and there's a lot of biases towards what that work means that affects their interests in that. Um, lastly, which is something I feel very passionately about, is that there's a misalignment between demographics of employees and residents. So that means that oftentimes the people who are creating policies or implementing those policies are not the ones who are receiving or those services or policies, um, which has huge implications for effectiveness of service work. So with this project, I've been working with a communi community partner called Govern for America. Govern for America is a social venture that aims to recruit uh, creative and entrepreneurial civil servants. It is a two-year fellowship program similar to the Teach for America model where students will be recruited and then um, work as a fellow in their placement. And they, a large portion of what they do is to train, develop, and connect those graduates with opportunities. So by development, that includes things like professional development and mentoring um, and yeah, connecting them with other professionals so that they can expand their network. So the three questions that I had for my research project were one, what are students' attitudes towards the public sector? Two, how do these attitudes vary? Three, how can we create a narrative surrounding public service that excites students? <coughs> so when doing this uh, project, a huge portion was creating a survey that uh, was sent out to 600 students from Brown, Bowdoin, the University of Rhode Island, Duke, and Indiana University. So this survey covered things such as career interests and attributes, um, and it also wanted to find out perceptions about these three sectors, those three sectors being government, nonprofit, and the private sector. So the three implications for the work that I'm doing, one is um, specific to my community partner, Govern for America. They're very interested in how they can create a narrative surrounding public service, particularly for different demographics. So for example, through um, my public policy Doug work, the public policy department is heavily skewed female. There's many more female than male people in the program. Um, so for example, something that Govern for America might be interested in is how do you try to attract males to public service, um, as an example. Um, and then another thing that has an impact for Brown and public policy and the Watson is reframing how we teach and discuss public service to students. So some, another thing that I'm interested in through the survey is learning about how these attitudes change through different class years at Brown. So for example, are we seeing that freshmen are really excited about public service but later seniors are not? Um, so that's something that's really interesting and I don't think we can make any like say that Brown is the reason but it would be interesting to see how um, like how that change affects people's interests. And then thirdly, a much broader connection is creating a more, a more effective public service. So like I mentioned, um, there is a misalignment between demographics and who is creating those policies and who is receiving them. Um, and so hopefully by this work that Govern for America is doing will allow a larger amount or more diverse group of people have access to these positions that um, a lot of people have assume are related to social capital um, and other things. So for connecting the dots, um, there's a few different ways this has connected the dots for me with my time at Brown. So I've been very interested in social entrepreneurship during my time at Brown through coursework, through the Social Innovation Initiative, um, and through previous work experiences. Um, and I find this to be a really interesting intersection between social entrepreneurship and government and direct policy work. Second, um, during my time at the governor's office, uh, the governor had a really huge initiative about uh, placing women and people of color on boards and commissions. So that was a huge uh, project that I was working on when I was in the boards and commissions office. So this work aligns really well with that initiative. Third is 
um, something that relates to my hometown. I'm from Cranston, Rhode Island, which is the city south of Providence. Um, and there was an article that came out this past summer um, in the Providence Journal about how uh, only 2% of government employees in the Cranston City Department are non-white, and around 25% are people of color in Cranston. Um, and I was really like shocked by that article because it goes into a story about how someone wanted who entered City Hall and no one spoke Spanish there. So that's something that I think really resonated with me and I think exists across the country through various uh, cities and states. And so, and lastly, this has connected with a lot of inclusivity initiatives that public policy has really been thinking about um, and how we can be more inclusive for people who are entering uh, or interested in public sector work. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of people are nervous about entering government work because there's a lot of implications like financially, oftentimes there are unpaid internships, um, which is something that's really hard for students. And there's also like the implication that in order to succeed, you need to know a lot of people. So um, that's another thing that really s steers people away from entering that work long term. Um, and so with this project, uh, I've been really excited to work on because I do think it connects the dots between a lot of my different work experiences and interests. Um, and I'm excited to answer any questions after our next presentation. So, thank you. Thank you, Alina. Our next speaker is Camila Ruiz Segovia. Um, she is going to be presenting on Catalyst Youth Voices Thinking the War, Rethinking the War on Drugs. Camila is a senior from Mexico City, double concentrating in political science and Latin American and Caribbean studies. She is a passionate advocate against the war on drugs in her home country and in Latin America. She worked as a research assistant at the Watson Institute, interned with the Drug Policy Alliance, and served as a civil society representative at the United Nations Special Session on Drugs. She is the assistant director of Catalyst, a pilot educational program about the war on drugs for high school students from across the Americas. Let's please welcome Camila. Thank you all to stay for this last presentation. I'm really excited to uh, finally share and talk a little bit about a project that I've been working on for the past year. I think it was great that Andrew spoke before me because my project is also about drugs and drug laws and the drug war. Uh, however, it is from a, an educational perspective. So, um, yeah, just in terms of how Brown has helped me connect the dots, I've been studying the war on drugs for, uh, throughout my career at Brown. And uh, I grew up in Mexico at the time that um, violence started becoming really intense. So I've been thinking of, um, a lot about of how can we uh, revert the damages associated with war on drugs. Uh, so this initiative is a little bit of an effort to try to think about alternatives that are not based on the criminalization of people and on violence. Um, so as Christina just mentioned, Catalyst is an 18-day bilingual intensive educational program for uh, youth who have been affected by the war on drugs coming from all across the Americas. So our focus is not only limited to uh, students in the United States, or, but people from all across the continent. We think it's important to think about this issue not um, as an issue that only impacts one country, but that is transnational in nature. Uh, this is a photo of one of, of two of our students, one from Colombia, one from Mexico. We also put the map of uh, the Americas upside down just to again uh, try to rethink uh, about how we see the world. Uh, because really the program is, is about thinking, rethinking our most basic conceptions about drugs, about how we conceive uh, drug users, uh, about how we conceive people who use and sell drugs. Uh, so, Andrew was really helpful in introducing what the war on drugs looks like in the United States. Uh, so I'm just gonna do like something really wild and try to explain it in one minute. Um, so uh, we can think of the war on drugs as an, as an international punitive legal framework that 
criminalizes people engaging in drug activities, whether those people are consumers, producers, sellers of drugs, or uh, people involved in drug trafficking. And I emphasize uh, people because I think uh, that it's important to recognize that even though it's called the war on drugs, it's really a war on people. Uh, its effects are felt across communities. It's not really about the plants and yeah, it's not really about plants and like substances, but really about the effects that it has in our communities. Uh, so just in terms of the effects, uh, the war on drugs has profound social costs that vary depending upon location, uh, but that disproportionately affect people of color, and I think that's really important to acknowledge. Uh, in the US, as Andrew mentioned, there is mass incarceration, and there is a criminalization of drug users. Not all, not all of the people who use drugs are uh, problematic drug users. There's also people that use drugs for pleasure, and that's important to take into account. In Colombia and in Mexico, we see the, the massive deployment of the military, we see a lot of cartel violence, we see uh, massive human rights abuses, that's similar in Central America, where we also see um, gang violence. Lastly, in places like Peru and Colombia, uh, Bolivia, sorry, we, we see the criminalization of, of um, sacred uses of drugs, uh, so like the coca plant, for example. Uh, so Catalyst is really like a, a, an effort to challenge uh, this punitive framework and to empower youth who have been directly uh, impacted by this conflict. This photo is from uh, the end of the program. Uh, by the end of the program, we bring together all the students to Mexico City uh, so that they have an opportunity to showcase their work and everything they learned throughout the program. Uh, this is again our student, Gera. He's from a community in Aguascalientes, Mexico. That, is, that has been really affected by uh, the deployment of the army. Uh, and I just really like this photo because he's standing up and uh, people, that are, people that are older than him are listening to him and really taking um, into consideration his perspective. Uh, so this is just a photo of the team. I just wanted to emphasize that our team is also uh, a team of, of international people. We come from Colombia, Canada, Mexico, Guatemala, uh, and the United States. Um, and we all also come from very dis different disciplines. So I study political science, but the team is also composed by educators, anthropologists, um, scient scientists, uh, because uh, even though we all study different things in college, we all share this, uh, um, this common thought that it was, it was just really outstanding that our drug education was limited to learning, have like drugs are bad, and drugs are a bad thing. Uh, when we were seeing in our community so much harm and so many um, horrible things that we never got an opportunity to talk in the classrooms. Um, so really this is just a project uh, and, and if we're uh, from our side to um, to share the knowledge we wish we, we would have had access to at a younger age. Um, and this is a photo of our students. This is again in our trip to Mexico City. The, um, the pilot program took place in a town that is called Cuernavaca in Mexico, which significantly is the first town um, where a movement against um, militarization happened in Mexico. Uh, so we just thought it was important to be at a place which also had a, an important history in this drug policy reform movement. Uh, our students came uh, from seven countries, from Peru, uh, the United States, Mexico, Colombia, um, Guatemala, uh, Peru, and Ecuador. This year we're actually expanding uh, the countries of, uh, from where our students are coming from. We're also having students from Bolivia, Paraguay, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, and Honduras. So, so really, um, in, in drafting our curriculum, we really wanted to emphasize, um, to use a social justice framework and to emphasize that the personal is political and that, that is, there is a lot of power in sharing our personal experience, experiences and in understanding that um, our stories are part of a larger history and a, and a part of a, of a larger political context. And um, we also thought that there was a lot of value in bringing together people from different countries so that they could learn how this same issue has very different implications in different places, but nonetheless uh, does create a lot of harm in our communities. 
Um, so we began the program with uh, some workshops on the drugs in the body to rethink why we choose to criminalize certain substances, but not all of them. So why is alcohol legal now, but not, it was not long ago, why we uh, criminalize the use of marijuana and so on. We also then go to a, a broader history of the war on drugs uh, at the continental level. So we don't not only focus in the United States, but um, in the entire region. We also talk about the geopolitics of, of the drug economy. So. Um, how drug production works, how drug trafficking works, how uh, the selling of drugs works as well. And lastly, we also focus on actors and institutions because again, this is a social conflict. This is about people and communities. This is not really about plants. Um, so in terms of how the program looks like on the ground, uh, we, uh, we begin the mornings with two classes per se. Uh, we sit in circles. Uh, we have uh, workshops in the morning, then in the evenings we invite over uh, activists that are, or advocates that are currently working in the drug policy reform movement. So we have, for example, people working in drug courts, we also had people who are fighting against uh, incarceration here in the United States, we have people from communities in Coca, the Pedrosian regions, we had uh, people in Mexico who are fighting against uh, the deployment of the army. Uh, paired with those talks, we also had a skill building workshops uh, so that the students feel empowered to go back to their communities and then implement a community project. So what we do is that we pair them with a community uh, activist from the region so that they can uh, develop a project after uh, the program ends. Um, so yeah, that's kind of really what um, the project looks like. Um, for me, it has been a really wonderful experience to be able to kind of finally um, participate in an opportunity that uh, allows me to, to share the knowledge that I've learned here at Brown um, and really to start thinking about how to create networks of young people that can think about alternatives to this conflict. And yes, and I'm happy to take any questions after my presentations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Camila. Um, at this time, we'll take a few questions for any and all of our presenters. Um, they can be specific questions or um, joint questions that they can each answer. Also, I just want to say I loved all your projects. I think you are just like doing such incredible work. Um, I guess my question is, like, how did you get um, started on being part of that project, or how did you get um, to people with so many different parts of the world and get students from so many parts of the world? Yes, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I was. I was really lucky to be connected with an educator from Mexico who was studying at Columbia uh, in, in New York. And she met with uh, one of the project founders, who's Theo. And it kind of just went like that. Uh, but I think the people involved in the drug policy reform movement kind of know each other. Um, for example, last, uh, last September, I went to an international drug policy reform conference. and. Yeah, it feels like it is a small movement, so people do know each other in general. Uh, but it's just been really wonderful to be able to work with people from so, such many different places and to be able to reach out to different communities. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question for Andrew. Um, I was curious if in Rhode Island or in the drug courts you've been in, is it purely for people who have their sole crime is drug possession or intent to sell, or is it anyone who, as a result of their drug use and addiction, has also committed other crimes? Thank you. That's a great question, actually. Um, <clears throat> something I didn't think or know about before working in the drug court, but actually, um, it, it was made eligible and crimes uh, that are committed as a result of addiction do come into the drug court so we do get um, uh, breaking and entering, petty larceny, non-violent non crimes that are committed as a result of addiction 
Uh, we have a lot of drug court participants who are stealing, um, you know, breaking into their family members' homes, stealing money, things like that. Uh, so yeah, I do see on the list on a day-to-day -day basis uh, petty larceny or breaking and entering. Um, but the more serious crimes like uh, armed robbery or robbery uh, won't, won't come, won't be able eligible for the drug court. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of those cases. Any other questions? Anne? I have a question regarding that. Um, so you mentioned that you were doing research at six different, five different, six different institutions. Um, have you, is, is that survey still out there and is the data still being collected? And I'm curious about sort of why those particular institutions. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the surveys is closed. Um, to, like logistically, my capstone's not due until like the end of finals, so like the data has not totally been um, compiled yet. But um, so at first, I um, was just interested in URI and Brown because I I was thinking like logistically, like that's where I feasibly could like probably make outreach to. Um, but um, when I was talking to my community partner, they were very receptive to helping me find people to like send out the survey to. So um, it was a little bit of like um, me saying like, oh, I think more state schools would be great and like geographic diversity would be great. And then using like the connections that uh, my community partner already had, um, we kind of landed on those schools. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I have a question for Bia and Leanne. Both of you are going on to pursue other degrees at other universities. How do you see yourselves um, utilizing what you've learned um, at Brown with the IMP program and international student support in your new universities? I think that I will um, look at any outreach programs that are at those universities, any community building programs. I am mostly interested in working with mental health advocacy as well, but I think that um, sort of the, the system, like working with administration and those skills will, will carry over. In terms of my international identity, I hope to bring a lot of that into my fiction writing. Um, and explore that um, through storytelling. Um, I think one of the main takeaways through my experience was how um, looking at experiences, looking at my own experiences on the ground, so among the different students as a mentee, and then at different levels as a mentor and then coordinator, has kind of allowed me to understand um, what is going on at different levels and then advocate on the highest level, I feel like actually directly mirrors what I'll be doing as a physician scientist where I'll be on the rounds as a doctor um, and then understanding the patient experience but also doing research and communicating with um, institutions at different levels in order to enact change. And so I think that the communication skills and the more human side of things that I learned through IMP and international student support will be very much um, translated into that work as well. And I think that moving forward, I'll be going home to Canada, but I'll always understand um, the international perspective. I'll never take citizenship for granted anymore. Um, and so I think that that will kind of help me understand issues with insurance or understanding cultural differences when it comes to what healing means um, because I know that it's not the same for everyone. Um, so yeah, that's how I intend this experience to inform my future. I'd love to expand that question to everybody. What, what, are, what piece of this are you taking with you after you graduate? I think that since mine was a research project, I think there was something about like independently working on something that was very useful. So in terms of like setting deadlines um, and working with someone from the, the outside and like being really responsible about setting those deadlines and like being really intentional about those and making plans. Um, so I think that was probably the, 
the biggest thing for me because although I had done research through internship experiences, it wasn't something that I directed by myself and that I was like the sole, like I was really in charge of. Um, and my capstone advisor, who's like amazing, but also has given me a lot of freedom in what I've been doing. So I think like that's probably the biggest thing, just like understanding how to set those deadlines for myself. Yeah, I think I think my my research project is basically a, a microcosm, an example of my time at Brown more broadly and in general. Um, you know, for me particularly, I went to a, a small private school where a lot of the uh, structure was rigid and, and laid out for us in terms of what we were going to, you know, what classes we would take and what our goals were and what we were going to accomplish. And then I came to Brown and it was really this open sense of pursue uh, what you want to do. We have the tools and resources necessary, but really take charge of your own uh, academic exploration and, and endeavors. And, and really the ability to, to question and confront rigid and efficient structures. So uh, you know, my work with the drug court in some sense involves that, but really my, my education more broadly at Brown and, and the classes I took and just delving into different areas, meeting different types of people from all over the world, uh, just allowed me to just have a, a complete and uh, more broad and, and better sense of, of how to approach things. The question is to what are the takeaways from the project, right? Yeah, so I'm actually doing this project again this summer, and um, one of my biggest, I mean, the, one of the most inspiring things for me was to was to, to reconnect with young people. I think once we come to college, we are still um, passionate and we are we are still really motivated to do thing, things, but. I, I had forgotten how passionate I was when I was in high school and how big my desire to change the world was. And um, I had participated before in kind of different initiatives uh, surrounding kind of um, campaigns to end the war on drugs, but I had never been in a classroom space teaching. And probably the most surprising thing for me is that I was the one that I was, that was learning the most. <laughs> I was learning from my students every single minute. So um, I don't know. Um, we are now moving into the second phase of the program, which is uh, sharing the curriculum with uh, professors to have so to have like a catalyst but for teachers. Uh, so we are just thinking about ways in which we can make this program more sustainable and uh, have better outreach. But thus far, I mean, it is a project that I'm really passionate about and that it does take a significant part of my brown time. Um, I'm also writing a thesis, which is also about the war on drugs. So this is the only thing that I think about all the time. But I just really like that uh, at Brown, I'm able to approach this conflict through research, through community activism, through my classes. Uh, and that's an, an incredible opportunity that is really um, shaped by the curriculum we have here at Brown. Um, so yeah, that. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Well, I want to thank all of the presenters one more time. Um, your presentations were very inspiring and um, I learned I learned so much. I'm glad that I came. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's give everyone a round of applause. Thank you.